Welcome back to Inspire. Today we feature the history of women in the military. We've come a long way, yet we have so far to go when it comes to the challenges service women face when enlisting to bravely fight for our country. Coming up next on Inspire. Inspire is sponsored by Kansas Furniture Mart, using furniture to inspire conversation. And by the Blanche Bryden Foundation. Hello and welcome to Inspire. I'm so excited to be here with my sisters and co-hosts Betty Lou Pardue and Amy Kelly. Ladies, we have a wonderful show planned for you today, including a feature that proves that home improvement projects aren't just for men. And we get out and get dirty with Dirty Girl Adventures on another trek into the great outdoors. And we feature a discussion on the lengthy history of women in the military. Women have come a long way, but we still have a very long way to go when it comes to gender bias, sexual harassment, and retention for service women. Joining us for today's discussion, we feature Dr. Carrie Wynn, Washburn University Professor of History, and Luann Maddox, who served with the United States Army for over 20 years. Now, Luann retired, get this, in 2009 as Lieutenant Colonel. That's awesome. Carrie and Luann, we thank you for being with us. And I just wanna know what got you in the military in the first place. Oh my goodness. Um, I almost went in the Navy right out of high school and then I decided to go to college instead. And I went through ROTC after I enlisted as a PFC in the reserves um, and I got a two year scholarship and I knew I wanted to become an officer so I could make a difference. That's amazing to me, especially being a lieutenant colonel, and I don't feel worthy. Oh, no. Tell me what your trek was like as you ended up becoming a lieutenant colonel, because how many years, and what were some of the things that you had to do along the way? I was stationed in probably 13 different locations over the 20 years that I was in. My goodness, um, like where? Fort Bragg was um, predominantly where I was stationed, um, and I am paying for it ever since. I jumped out of airplanes and wow. my back does not like me now. My, <laughs> my knees do not like me now, but um, it is a rush. So if you ever get the opportunity to do that, you definitely should. Yeah. I'm gonna have to pass on that. But <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we all thank you for your service. Absolutely. I mean, there's no, no question about thank that. Thank you. I'm curious yeah. for the change. You, you, you joined in what year? You 1989. So you've yeah. seen a great deal of changes in the military over the time. Oh, yeah. what, ha what has been the most refreshing change to you and what has been the least refreshing? I think the most refreshing has been since I uh, retired and that's that women are now allowed to be rangers, go to ranger school. Um, they're allowed to command combat arms units. Um, they're allowed to serve wherever they want to uh, within reason. So. That's just, it's super encouraging, yeah. Mm -hmm. And tell us the, the reason that you retired. So in 2004, my husband passed away uh, with something very similar to Luke Gehrig's disease. And I knew going forward that um, the Army would not miss me if I stayed or if I retired, uh, but my daughter would. And our daughter was four at the time when her, when her dad passed away. and. Um, she's going to be 21 next week, and it's, it's been a long, hard journey of being a single parent, but it was worth it. Um, I would not change a thing. Uh, it's, to me, being there for her during those formative years was much more important than staying in the Army and achieving rank and, and whatever. But that so. is one of the hard things about being a woman mm -hmm. and, and the fact that you're trying to serve your country as well, but you need to serve your family. Definitely, and my family comes first. Yeah, always. Talk about your family. When you first decided that you wanted to enlist, what were their thoughts? Did they think, oh my goodness, Luann has lost her mind? Or were they like, girl, go out there and do it because we were, we're all behind yeah. you? Um, 
I think knowing that when I was in college going in as an officer, they were very supportive, never tried to discourage me from becoming a military person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is hard, I, I, as a woman, it is hard to think and talk about the military without acknowledging some of the downsides of being female in the military. Mm -hmm. Certainly in the, in, for the U.S. military would be the sexual harassment and, and worse. Mm -hmm. um, if you are encountered uh, by a young woman who is considering the military experience, how would, how would you address that? How would you encourage someone to go into the military knowing that it could be really rough at times? And, and I'll be very honest, the military isn't for everyone, mm -hmm. male or female. Um, I would have to say that it's just like any other corporation or business. Mm -hmm. You have good people and you have bad people and you have good systems and bad systems. The military has those systems in place for reporting, whether it's sexual harassment, equal opportunity, you name it. But just like a corporation, it's dependent on the people. And so if you don't have a good person in that position to facilitate uh, growth and reporting and um, correction and justice, then it won't happen. So you have to really, really want to do it um, depending on what you want to do with your life and what job. And there are, there are so many civilian equivalent jobs in the military. So you, know, you could go for whatever reason if you wanted to get um, college first or college after or or not or serve 20 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I'd stay, you know, past four years mm -hmm. and there I was 20 years later and it was just So there was fast. a lot that you loved about it. Oh yeah. yeah, the camaraderie I think and and I still stay in touch with a lot of the people that, that I'm close with. Um, you know, I don't miss getting up in, in the early morning, <laughs> um, uh, but I, I stay in touch with those who I want to, because it, it is like a family, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the history, Dr. Wynn. Mm -hmm. How do you get this to, to young people to appreciate the history mm -hmm. of, of the military, women in military? Mm -hmm. Well, really it intersects with a lot of different courses or a lot of different subjects in U.S. history. So um, I teach U.S. history and looking at it from that perspective, um, you know, really to think about women in the military, women have been involved in warfare in the United States in supporting roles and in essential roles as well um, since the very beginning. Uh, so it comes into a lot of courses in women's history. I teach a course on um, women in World War II uh, here at Washburn, which uh, it focuses on U.S. women, and then I teach it with a colleague in French language. So we do kind of U.S. versus France, some comparisons of women's experiences. Oh, I love it. The whole we can mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it's really about the totality of kind of women's experiences. So not just in the military, but then also in support through industry and all sorts of different, and politics and journalism and all sorts of different venues. Um, but the military is a piece of that, of course, as well, and a very large piece that changes a lot during World War II. So were they recognized for their achievements at that time? Because I watched a lot of like military movies over Memorial Day, and it was all about the girl that got left behind. Nothing about the women that were serving right along with them. So talk about that. Well, so I tell you, we watch films in this class and the films are much worse uh, in some <laughs> ways in terms of portraying that stereotype, right? Um, but that was something that women were expected to say. That was an image they were expected to present during World War II, that they were just doing this as, um, you know, something that was uh, personal fun or patriotic, but it was just for that moment in time. That's what they were expected to say. Now, for many women, it was uh, calling, they served in essential services, um, they flew airplanes, they uh, you know, reported on what was going on in the war. They were absolutely critical in taking care of the mail and communications, right, which was essential on the battlefield and all throughout the European theater and the Pacific theater. Women served in a lot of essential roles, but they were expected to downplay their achievements in the time period, and they were very unevenly recognized for their service. Did women serve in the American Revolution? Did they serve in the Civil War or any of the wars, the War of 1812 or any of the wars in between? Mm -hmm. um, 
Yes. So, uh, <laughs> so um, in the Revolutionary War, for example, well, and in all of the wars, I think that you mentioned, um, women were expected to serve in kind of service roles. Um, and in the American Revolution, for example, they were called many women were called camp followers, and they did things like laundry services and nursing and things like that. And um, George Washington very famously saw them as a nuisance or kind of a necessary evil uh, to have them kind of do that sort of work. But there were always women who stepped outside of the bounds of what was expected women's work, right? Mm -hmm. um, one very famous example is Harriet Tubman, who was famous as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. who served not only as um, cooking, uh, nursing, but was also a scout during the Civil War and wow. commanded men as a scout and conducted reconnaissance. In her later years, in her, I guess you could call it a retirement, although people didn't really retire, right? right. Some of her advocates sought to get her a military pension, and they made this case, right? She commanded men. She worked in very dangerous settings. Um, it had to be done through an act of Congress, and that did not go through. So in the end, she received a widow's pension based upon her husband's service to oh the United goodness. States. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, instead of her own. We'll be back with more on the history of women in the military. Coming up next, we feature proof that home improvement isn't just a man's job anymore. Hello, I'm Janice Watkins, the CEO of Topeka Habitat for Humanity. Today we're going to be discussing the importance of cleaning and maintaining your pee trap in your restroom. If you notice a smell emitting from your sink or if your bathroom has a bit of an odor, the first thing you're going to want to check is your pee trap. A pee trap serves two purposes. It is to collect solid objects so that they don't enter a drain line. So we often find wedding rings and other objects that might be dropped down the sink in the pee trap. It is important to keep it clean because it does allow water to collect so that gas emissions don't re-enter your home. So it's always supposed to be filled with a small amount of water, but if water can't be trapped in it and it's clogged, it won't do its job efficiently. So the first thing you wanna do is obviously turn off your water, which turn offs can typically be found on these connectors. And to turn them off, you're just gonna to wanna to switch them over Check your water to make sure it's turned off. The P-trap is this curved fixture that connects your sink to the drain. And you're going to want to have a bucket handy because it is designed to hold water. So once we have it off, you can see that this one is relatively clean. If it was emitting a smell, or if it had something clogged in it, you would wanna just rinse it out or take a wire brush and clean that out. Once that is done and your P-trap is clean, all you need to do is go through the steps of reconnecting it, which is quite simple. And then turning back on your water. And then your home should be free of smell and have an efficient working P-trap. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you get inspired to address your own home maintenance. And we're back with Carrie Wynn and Luann Maddox. Okay, ladies, in the last segment, we discussed the history of women in the military and delved a bit into our own experiences. So let's continue with this discussion. Um, we had talked about Harriet Tubman and the role she played in the military. I mean, most of us are familiar with her Underground Railroad experience. But you were saying that someone tried to get an act of Congress through to get her some military recognition. What happened? Mm -hmm. So uh, for the, it just didn't make it that final step. Um, you know, she had advocates. In the end, what they said was that there was not enough documentation, right? 
of her efforts at espionage. So yeah. how can we get her recognized? Because now I'm on the Harriet train. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so I'm sure that there are uh, kind of movements afoot to provide more recognition um, in terms of uh, commemoration, statues. You know, even just knowing the history and talking to other people about the history, I think is really helpful in terms of recognizing the achievements of Harriet Tubman and many other women. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So okay. when did women start getting that kind of recognition? Like, or have they? Do you, or, yeah, <laughs> or have they, right, yeah, do we know, yeah. I mean, I certainly no. the lieutenant colonel gets that recognition. There yeah. is a more formal role that is crafted and recognized for women. Probably the turning point would be World War II, when there are first wow. women's auxiliaries created, and then um, women explicitly serving in the military and recognized as serving in the military. So the Women's Army Corps, the WAVES, which was the mm -hmm. naval equivalent, mm -hmm. the WASPs, um, which mm -hmm. were the Women's Air Service, pilots. So the women's air service pilots, for example, flew planes that were not easy to fly. They were really mm -hmm. difficult to fly. We read in my class an autobiography by a woman who just describes how awful it was to fly this plane where the gears went out and it was like steering a bus in the air. And it was like, <laughs> um, and there were women who, uh, women's air force service pilots who died ferrying these planes in the United States mm -hmm. in plane crashes. Um, but their work for the WASPs was not fully recognized until much, much later. In fact, quite recently, I think it was in the 21st century. You mentioned going back and forth between the United States mm -hmm. and France. Mm -hmm. um, do they get more recognition? If you're a French woman, would you get more recognition? That's a really good question. Um, I think in different ways, right? So in this time period, um, during World War II, um, you have Vichy France. So France um, becomes allied with um, Germany, right? With, and so there's a Nazi-aligned government in France at the time. So um, women who fight in, with the French resistance and an underground kind of espionage sort of fashion um, are really some of the women who, to whom attention is called um, in France, for example. How can we get more attention brought to women? in the military. I mean, we'll see feature films about guys mm -hmm. in the military all the time, but not about the women. What can we do to kind of push that? I think we probably need more women to tell stories, right? Mm -hmm. We need more people to do documentaries, I would say, yes. and to do historical research. If you're interested in history, I mean, many of my students are now doing things like documentaries and websites mm -hmm. and, um, podcasts, you know, probably. podcasts, mm -hmm. uh, things that are published, you know, pretty widely to a popular audience. And so I would say if you're interested in the history, um, you know, take classes in the history, find out about the primary sources where you can go to an archive and do research, do or Oral histories, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talk to your grandparents, talk to your parents, talk to aunts and uncles and people in your community. Um, because I think a lot of the history has simply not been told. There are so many stories that we could tell. Uh, and I think we need to start telling them more and more to each other yes. and build up some more support for that. You know, that is one of the things you were just saying, because um, with Memorial Day passing in our greatest generation, mm -hmm. it usually focuses on the men. Mm -hmm. But there were so many women and I'd like them to be able to find some women to tell their stories. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there is, the Library of Congress has a veterans oral history project that people can participate in, where then those oral histories can be archived. Um, there are lots of ways to preserve the history of people you know, um, and, to, like, and to find photographs, and find out who's in those photographs before uh, that information is no longer around, right? Before you no longer have the people who were in them to talk to. All of those things, I think, are important steps towards recognition and towards telling the history. Are there organizations for women who have retired from the military or have, have done service that are for women? You know, we know there's lots of organizations helping our vets, not nearly enough for our vets, in right. my opinion. However, are there any that are specifically for women? I am not personally familiar with uh -huh. some. There may be some out there. Um, and you say bring, bring attention to, I stay pretty incognito. Most people would not know me walking down the street and say, oh, she's a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel. I don't wear the hat. I don't wear the shirt, you know, very often. Um, but there are many women who have written books um, that were from the military. General Ann Dunwoody is one of them, mm -hmm. you know, four-star right. general, AMC commander, airborne uh, commander, just an amazing uh, human being. So, you know, if we can promote those books, even if it's in a reading club or something like that, or promote them in school for young, young children to read. Um, but I'm not familiar with any specific organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, these ladies, a doctor 
and a lieutenant colonel. I mean, Carrie and Luann, we thank you for being here with us. Yes, you have inspired us. Uh, you know, an inspiration for our future, and we thank you so much for your service and, and your continued service. And up next, we are gonna get out and get dirty with Dirty Girl Adventures. And in the military, just think of how that was. <laughs> There'll be tips for preparing you for your next trek into the great outdoors. Today we're going to talk about safety considerations that people need to think about before they go hiking. So when you're planning to go on a hike, um, whether it's the summer or the winter, some of the same things apply. You need to make sure that you let somebody know where you're going and your expected length of time to be gone. You should take your phone with you. Um, to save battery, you might put it on airplane mode so that when you need it, it will still have a charge. In the summer, you need bug spray. It's always good to go with a partner so that you have somebody with you in case something happens. You need water. Always. You always need water. So generally, uh, people will have a small pack. So I have water and a first aid kit, just minimum stuff. This is a bigger pack, but you can put fewer things in the pack. You could also take a trail map. Sometimes we don't take a map, but we know where our car is generally. And while we're hiking, we continuously think about the direction that we would need to go if we needed to go back to our vehicle. And you definitely want to pay attention to trail markers. Every trail has some markers specific to it. So before you leave on your hike, you need to know what the markers are for that trail and be familiar with what the different colors of markers might mean. And then of course, it's important to check the weather. In Kansas, you never know what the weather might bring, so it's good to know ahead of time, you know, if it's gonna start pouring rain in an hour, you need to time your hike just right. Um, or if it will be windy or super hot, you're more likely to be dehydrated. So knowing the weather conditions help you be prepared for a good outdoor outing. So it is important to know your own limits when you're going on a hike or on any outdoor adventure. Um, and to not overstress yourself um, the first few times. You need to test your limits perhaps sometimes. So the conditions will make a difference. Hiking on a cool, rainy day is easier. Hiking on a hot summer day makes it a little bit harder. So knowing your limits and always having a plan is an important aspect of safety on the trail. Another thing to think about regarding safety in hiking is knowing the terrain that you're going to be on. Although people think that Kansas is pretty flat, many of the trails are located in areas that have lots of rocks and lots of trees. So rocks can sometimes be a little slippery and there can be very steep inclines here in Kansas. So be prepared for that. This is Jennifer and Denise with Dirty Girl Adventures. We hope we've inspired you to get out and get dirty. Thank you to Jennifer and Denise of Dirty Girl Adventures for the tips for our next outdoor adventure. Ladies, we certainly did learn a lot about the history of women in the military and it was inspiring to talk with Luann and hear her story. So what did you learn from today's discussion? Well, Lieutenant Colonel, I mean, that's huge. huge. And then Dr. Wynn, I mean, boy, accomplished women. Yes. And I'm indebted to them both and grateful to both of them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I feel very unworthy to, you mm -hmm. know, being in their presence when, because of the Lieutenant Colonel and also with Dr. Wynn's experience and knowledge of, uh, you know, we had this d active discussion of what Harriet Tubman did. Just one. We picked one woman right. out of history who we happen to be familiar with her name and all the things that she did. Think of the, the thousands of women, nameless women, who did equally magnificent things that are, it's gone. The thousands of women of color who did amazing right. things in the military that we will never know about. And someone should talk about their history. Right. Someone should have them being, you know, on some kind of money. I'm still about Harriet Tubman. Anything beyond the Underground Railroad. And now I'm like, 
you know what? This woman deserves some money. Everything that she did for our country, Absolutely. And I, it, she should be lauded. And we're just now having that conversation. And then women currently serving, right. you know, because we don't talk a whole lot about that either. But we always talk about the gal that got left behind. But there are plenty of women who are serving and they're leaving their families behind for our sakes. Right. And, and so many of them now, it, seems to, it does seem to make news when we're, they're admitted to a certain program or a certain exactly. branch of the service right, right. when they're admitted there. But you know, think of how hard they have to work, almost extra mm -hmm. hard, exactly. prove themselves even more. Of course, that's with anything, it seems yes. like. And then gender biases. Right. You know, how does that play into it? Maybe some of them would have achieved earlier, but they didn't because of their gender. I mean, there's all these things to mm -hmm. think about when it comes to being in the military. But I mean, their service, we laud you. We appreciate yeah. right, you. Right, right. Absolutely. Thank you for the, yeah. not just the uh, sacrificial lives that they are living, but their families as well. Right. And I would say memorialize your stories. For those women in the military please. right now, mm -hmm. please memorialize your stories. There's so many of us that are interested and would like to know we yes. don't have the military background and we want to know. And so, uh, you know, talk about it, blog, podcast, yes. I don't know, pick whatever you want, journal. Let us know what your experience has been like so that our, our kids and our grandkids and our great, great mm -hmm. grandkids can understand what the female military experience has been in our current day and age. And for my generation and those that are after me, listen, because there are a lot of stories that my family told. And I'm like, yeah, it's just yeah, another story. Next, yeah. you know, can we go outside now? I, I mean, and I wish that I had looked at the pictures more so I knew who were in the pictures and, right. and, and heard the story so I could be able to tell those stories to more and more people. So please pay attention to what our four fathers and four mothers had talked about so we can be the bearers of those stories going forward. And that's all the time we have for today. We sure hope you've been just as inspired as we have by the powerful stories and features showcasing the magnificent women making moves in our community, nation, and our world. And as a reminder, you can watch this program again at watch.ktwu.org. And if you're so inspired to learn more about our guests, find out what is coming up on future shows and to get access to additional content, be sure to visit our website at www.ktwu.org forward slash inspire. Inspiring women, inspiring you on KTWU. Thank you for watching. Inspire is sponsored by Kansas Furniture Mart, using furniture to inspire conversation. And by the Blanche Bryden Foundation.